we just did a TED talk together. We're good. Okay, we're good. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, calling Doug Wood. No surprise. All right, we're going to have another panelist up here. Um, so before we get started with our respondents, I would love to hear just, here's Doug. Hello, dear. Um, I would love to hear just a couple of uh, kind of quick popcorn um, comments or uh, maybe just comments, and then we'll turn to questions after we hear from the respondents. So anyone want to jump up and give a sort of quick response or what you talked about at your table? We got a mic person running around. I know you were talking. I heard you talking. <laughs> you got a lot to say. Here we go. Thank you. William. Uh, mic trouble? that in a way that t is personal to your story and why you're in this work, but also doesn't uh, denigrate or put a whole frame of people in the kind of deficit narrative. So we just, we didn't get, come up with an answer, but it was something we talked about. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we're not going to try to get to these right now, but I would love to loop back to that. How do you tell both truths um, in a way that moves us all forward? Thank you, William. Any other uh, quick comments from you all? Is there another one? Yes, right here. Um, uh, this is more of what we talked about in the workshop I was in, but how do we take, I don't have an answer to this, but how do we take, as we were talking about youth engagement and um, the line between listening to youth, but then also not making youth like a token, just like, oh, here's a young person. Like, what do the youngins think? And then just an organization. <laughs> taking you know, their ideas, their views, and saying, oh yeah, this, this young person from rural Alaska just said this, when in reality the kid has no clue what they're talking about. So, yeah. Thank you. So true, authentic youth engagement beyond tokenism. Thank you. Uh, I'll take one more. Oh, over here. Here we go. Uh, well, not that we discussed it. I raised it and I saw some nods, so I feel that there was some, some agreement, I hope. Uh, and it's Travion, and, and when you asked uh, um, how many uh, black men or black families are millionaires, my experience personally, you know, I, I, I've seen that used against me, not me, but the, the group that I represent. So throughout my professional life, uh, I've had my environment tell me, well, Carlos, you're Latino, why, why isn't everybody else making it? So that's sort of the, it's my, you know, the concern that I have. Yes, we're proud of it, but then it could work against you as it did with me. Mm. Thank you. So a, a, another kind of tokenism is, yeah. Looks like we've got one more back here, and it looks to me like, okay, go ahead. Uh, mine is more of an observation, because we collectively in this community also put those images out. I was in Kentucky, and someone says to me, every time I see an image of a poor person, it's always a black or Latino. I'm poor too, and that person was white. So we ourselves do it in the way we talk about our population and the images that we put out. Thank you, thank you, Marjorie. So, um, okay, so I am going to now look at this amazing 
cast of luminaries. Um, I am going to st uh, start with um, a question for, so uh, actually, why don't I just introduce our panelists. Uh, we have John Gombertz from America's Promise. We have Doug Wood from the Ford Foundation. We have uh, John Colburn from Amer Skills for America's Future. I'm sorry, John Colburn. <laughs> Bearded John over here and bearded Adrian over here from um, Arizona State University. Um, so I am going to start with Doug. Um, so Gail spoke to the role of foundations um, in addressing racial equity, and I know that, uh, and moving beyond just diversity and multiculturalism, and I know that this is something that the Ford Foundation has long been concerned about, but is now kind of really doubling down on inequality and calling that out as a priority and in how the foundation actually is going to operate. So I would love to have you speak to that and then also just sort of respond to what, uh, what Gail spoke to at the same time. Great, I'll do that. Uh, it's fantastic to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Steve wanted me to tell you all about our new strategy, but I can't do that. And the reason why I can't do that is because our board is meeting tomorrow and Friday to vote on the new strategy. So, oh, but what I can Steve's do, <laughs> <laughs> but what I can do is to talk about this issue of a framework that we have been discussing around addressing inequality. So I would point to you a marvelous blog, an essay, that was recently written by our foundation president, Darren Walker, which is titled Towards uh, a New Gospel of Wealth, mm -hmm. which is actually something that he talked about with respect uh, to an essay that was originally written by Andrew Carnegie, in 1889 about the gospel of wealth, and he also combined some philosophical understandings of uh, both Adam Smith as well as Martin Luther King Jr. And in that essay, he suggests uh, three ways in which foundations and all of us can begin thinking about addressing inequality. The first one relates specifically to Gail's point, and that is thinking very critically about serious conversations on cultural norms and structures, particularly when it comes to race, gender, class, and ethnic biases. The second area that he talks about in that particular essay is really trying to encourage foundations to sort of get away from their paternalistic instincts. And as many of you know, I have said on this stage many, many times that we are not interested in philanthropic colonialism. Amen. And what he said in an essay was that we should change our worldview from grant making to change making where in fact we support individuals who are most affected to have a voice in their world and addressing issues related to inequality. So for example, we recently had this great partnership and continue to have a great partnership with an organization called the Anti-Recidivism Coalition, which is founded by Scott Butnick, who is a great friend of mine, and even though he's a, he's a marvelous film producer, he produced the Hangover films, but he's very much engaged in juvenile justice reforms through the Anti-Recidivism Coalition, which is a coalition of young people really trying to make policy change in California and nationally. Uh, their most recent success was the passage of SB 261. If you're in California, you know that this is a, a marvelous law that passed around youth offender parole hearings. So in the past, if you were a youth under parole, you would go under the same circumstances that an adult would. This allows for, during the parole hearing, if you're a youth offender, uh, to, for the judge to actually consider adolescent brain development with respect to your uh, particular issue, and which we also heard about that yesterday in our leadership council. Uh, and it also raises the age to 23 in terms of being eligible. But it was, in fact, students and former juvenile offenders who went to the legislature to testify, who talked with the governor, who mobilize people in communities to really push through that change in policy. And we're very happy to be a partner uh, in that work with them. Mm -hmm. And most recently, we've had uh, the passage of our Pathways Project in California, which is gonna bring access to high quality education to thousands of people who are incarcerated and formerly incarcerated. And it's actually the people who were formerly incarcerated who were the biggest advocates for that. And I'm also wearing a pin, a Just Leadership pin right now. Many of us know Glenn Martin. And the whole point of just leadership, which we also fund, is to make sure the people who are incarcerated and formerly incarcerated have a voice in shaping policy that affects them and really trying to get to issues of inequality. 
May I say one other thing about that? Um, one of the students who testified in front of the California legislature, his name is Kent, came to the United States at six years old, did not speak a word of English, at 16 years old, was in solitary confinement for years. At 16 years old. Now, because of the advocacy that he's been doing, now he has a chance to get a, a degree. He's uh, now enrolled in college. He works for the California Chamber of Commerce. He has access to health care, transportation, housing, uh, and all the issues that try to mitigate against criminogenic risk factors because of the leadership of people like Kent. And so this notion that we should not be paternalistic, I think is important. The third thing that Darren talks about in the essay is the notion that we should address the root causes of inequality. And uh, actually, when I was listening uh, to Lada speak this morning, this afternoon rather, uh, he actually talks about this in specific terms in an essay when he talks about the obligations of capitalism. And he actually quoted Henry Ford II in a 1976 letter to our trustees where he says, in essence, we are a creature of capitalism, but we have the responsibility to help improve and strengthen our progenitor. So in that way, we want to be able to encourage the production and structures around inclusive markets so that people who are uh, poor, who are marginalized, who are from low income uh, backgrounds have access to markets so that they can have and build um, their uh, issues with regard to uh, capital and, and so forth so they can actually be able to be productive members in society and help to address issues of inequality. So I think the last thing I want to say is related to what Trevion said, and that's the notion of what Darren said in that second piece, and that is it's important for us to encourage uh, us rethinking and, uh, and uh, the whole issue of changing the narrative, particularly when it comes to marginalized populations in the country to help address issues of inequality. Did that answer the question? It sure did. <laughs> <laughs> That was great, thank you. Um, there are so many places I could go in terms of a conversation just on this, just on what we've just talked about here. But I'm going to actually just keep us moving and turn to uh, you, John. And I think you have, um, uh, you wanted to show a clip from some sure. work by, by America's Promise. Do you want to sure. set it up? Sure, sure. Thank you. Uh, and thank you. It's, it's great to be here. Um, I want to talk particularly about what Trevian was talking about, about narrative and the narrative that exists around opportunity use, what America's Promise is trying to do to dislodge that narrative, and as Gail suggested, when you dislodge a narrative, you have to replace it with a better narrative. Um, we've just come out, uh, we've just released a report, uh, second one in two years, in which we've spoken with hundreds and hundreds of opportunity use and then surveyed uh, many more to try to understand the story from their perspective about what's happened. And since none of us anymore qualify as young, I think I'll just take the, the opportunity to, well, let's listen for two minutes to people who are, who are right there and then come back and talk about how we might influence the narrative. Okay. It was like I never thought that anybody would Good sound, care about bad me, pick. like a family would. And it was like, no, this random woman Cares about me like my own mother. It's supposed to be a video, not a tape. I felt like nobody around me cared, so I really didn't care. Should we, During should my we school career, yeah, I wonder I never if we can had... pause this. Can you pause it? Can you see if you can rally up the. Oh, here we go. All right. All right. Back to the beginning. There you go. Thank you. All right. It was Love like technology. I never thought that anybody would care about me like a family would. And it's like, no, this random woman cares about me like my own mother. I felt like nobody around me cared, so I really didn't care. During my school career, I never had someone who like simplified the whole process. And I couldn't focus. I couldn't go to school, because I felt like no one there understood. Before I got locked up, everything was going in my favor. Being frustrated, um, I started skipping school. I didn't feel like they were taking the initiative to really try to help me learn the way that I learned. I was always getting suspended. Like, I felt like I was getting picked on by teachers. But she was like, you're going to do great things. And it was, she meant it. In life, all you need is a person to be willing to understand you, to listen, to give an ear and arm, 
something to help you out. Someone that's always there to, to help them when times are rough and to show them that this is the right way to do it. And let that one person know about you know, their life and what's going on because people would go to school and act like everything is all good, but you don't know about their life. Are you okay? Is all they could have asked me and things could have been a lot different. They don't need a teacher to be like, oh, he's a bad kid pointing the finger at him. They need, oh, you can change, you know? They need somebody to uplift them. I walk in this morning, she, she like, how you going with your classes? How many more quizzes you got to do? How many of this, how many of that? You need help with this, I got somebody to help you with that. Ms. Alvarez is one teacher I feel very connected with. She's my advisor and she really helps me stay on the ball. My parents had always, had always said like, you know, you're gonna be the first one to graduate. Having adults in my life who weren't family and who still believed in me, that is why I am who I am today. I knew I was capable of just of doing something better than I was. I have a chance to pull myself up. I wanna graduate. I wanna be something in life. Thank you. So in this, in this research, we, we sought to find out what young people said about those who are around them, um, uh, the relationships that were helping them get forward. But even in this video and in the research we did a, a year ago, we called this one Don't Quit On Me. Uh, a year ago, we put out research we called Don't Call Them Dropouts. And that was the title, starting from the title was about the narrative. The word dropout conjures quitter and loser. And you don't have to be Donald Trump or a Donald Trump admirer to know that in America, we don't like quitters and losers, right? Nobody's on the side of a quitter and loser. If you change that narrative, if you listen to these young people and you change that narrative to young people being survivors and strivers, Everybody wants to be on the side of a survivor and a striver. So when we heard, when we listened to these young people and heard exactly the same aspirations that we probably had for ourselves, that we had for our kids, we have for the people who are immediately around us, what did young people say over and over again? I want more education, I want a job, I want a good place to live, and I want to have a family. Same thing, right? Same thing. So changing that narrative, and we heard extraordinarily, extraordinary resilience, grit, toughness, strength. Blair said it earlier, like this should be strength-based. We heard all that. Yet somehow, the thing that's going on in America, most people don't hear that. We've heard from some companies that are quite enlightened, and we have to find a narrative for, with, by, and around these young people that makes it possible for everybody to embrace this idea. It is awesome that there are companies that are thinking the way that Prudential and Starbucks and others who are here are thinking, but we need many, many more people to think that way. And in order to do that, we have to find a narrative. And I'll, I'll just say one last thing about that. The narrative has to, look, we don't, none of us love a narrative that makes us feel bad about ourselves. We have plenty of reasons to feel bad about ourselves, but we are not gonna embrace, and we're not as a nation gonna embrace a narrative that's gonna make us feel bad about ourselves. We have to find a narrative that people can accept and get behind. And I think that when one listens to the young people, like in this video, like who we've been talking to, like so many of the communities here are working with, we get that out there. So Blair said that those CEOs had a real aha moment when they sat at that table with those young people and they thought, my God, these guys are awesome. I'd hire any one of them. How do we make that experience available to way more people in America so they can have that same aha moment, they can switch sides without saying they were wrong, because nobody loves to say they're wrong, and, and now become part of the solution. I'm really, you know, I think this is at the heart of, a, a, a movement needs a story, 
And this movement needs a story that comes straight from the young people who are telling it and living it. Thank you. So I am hearing this strong theme around changing the narrative that I think is so powerful. And I love the way Doug connected advocacy and advocacy by the young people themselves with changing the narrative. And before we go to our other respondents, I would just love to ask Trabian or Gail, if you want to, or Lapa, if you want to say anything in response to what you've heard here so far about changing the narrative and the paradigm. Thank you for that invitation. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was making notes, you know, I got to get back to that. But um, so it was about four years ago when we uh, at the Kellogg Foundation convened all our grantees in this space, and the theme of that meeting was reclaiming the narrative, changing the narrative, take, telling our own stories. And I would like to respond to what you've said and to what the gentleman said in the audience. What we need is an authentic narrative, mm -hmm. a narrative that tells the stories that are painful, a narrative that captures the extreme resilience and persistence and absolute miracles of life. What we as a country have to do is embrace our full story. We have denied so much of our story as a nation because it makes us feel bad, right? But imagine how much better we would feel mm. if we embraced the whole of who we are as a country. What, not just what people have contributed, but what we've, what we've learned. You know, this idea of racial hierarchy was part of our developmental first 250 and 300 years, right? When we were most malleable as a country, so this concept of racial hierarchy got embedded, if you will, in our brain structure. But we are adult, or we're adolescent as a country <laughs> and now. <laughs> and so we can say, OK, that's where we were. This is who we need to be now. And this is who we'll be in the future. But it's embracing all of it. And you can only do that with the authentic voices. I agree with you 100%. We have to listen and we have to hear. But we're so segregated as a country, we don't have opportunities to listen and hear other, the perceived other's story. Just, if I could add just one thing. Please. Um, one of the things I'm excited about is the narrative is changing, right? Like, um, whether we acknowledge it or not, one of the things that's most fascinating in the work that you know, we see in Be Me is uh, younger folks don't really buy into our frames of reference, right? So um, the, the civil rights era for this generation is as long ago as World War II was when I was a kid, right? And so wow. consequently, they're already leading a different change, whether we are telling their stories or not. All that stuff around uh, Trayvon Martin or Freddie Gray or any of these, those stories stayed alive in social media by young people long enough for the popular media to pick it up, right? This generation is the first generation to have ever elected a black man president twice, you know, uh, in their early uh, political career, right? Or to, lead up to see uh, marriage equality become the law, right? So all the things about what were unimaginable 10 years ago in my generation, this generation sort of encounters them, experiences them, and even this stuff about the violence that we're seeing from police in other places, what's really interesting to me about this is the incidents of hate crime in the last decade are actually on a decline, a pretty significant decline. But our tolerance of it is also on a decline, right? And I think that's all owing to a generation that has a chance to set the narrative the way they choose to set it, rather than continue the one that they inherited. That is so, should we do a little, yeah. <laughs> That's so, um, that's so positive to look to the tools of the, of the next generation to change the narrative because I think about how segregated we are as a country and I think about what uh, Dr. Pastor said this morning about how you can't other someone you know, but if we're racially segregated, it's very easy to other and so I think we do have to look at different kinds of tools uh, to, to counter that. So I am going to now turn to um, John Colburn. 
who is uh, at the end. Yeah. Uh, and so um, Skills for America Future is doing work around connecting employers with community colleges. That's your work. Um, and I would love to know how you are um, thinking about this question of changing the narrative in those two institutions um, in particular and in their work with each other and how you would bring this racial equity lens and frankly racism uh, into uh, your work. Uh, well, thanks so much, and uh, great to be here. And can I just say, this is my first time at, a, at this conference. Uh, I am just bowled over by the passion and commitment of the folks that are here today. So uh, it's just a pleasure to be here. Um, so you know, a, a, as Lily says, uh, I, I work at an Aspen program called Skills for America's Future, and we're really focused on building partnerships between employers and community colleges as a way to simultaneously meet the needs of employers and also advance economic opportunity for students and learners uh, so that they can uh, find and, 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 and hold uh, good jobs and find uh, good careers for themselves. And I think as I think about this panel, I, I have both a, a, a sense of a little pessimism uh, and then a sense of some optimism. So let me just take each of those. Um, the source of pessimism, I think, really builds on this notion of segregation of this country. Um, and uh, one of the institutions that uh, helps promote that segregation is one of the institutions I work with very closely and dearly love, and that's our, our community colleges and our post-secondary educational institutions. Mm -hmm. Post-secondary education in this country actually works uh, to reify uh, social, uh, social status and social structures in this country. Um, the, the dumbest rich kid uh, has better chance going to an elite school than the smartest poor kid. Uh, and, and so we have a real problem with the way that we, uh, we proceed with, with, uh, with uh, post-secondary education in this country. And what's more, uh, the institutions that are best designed, best geared, best located uh, to serve the populations that we care about uh, tend to be some of our poorest performing institutions. We know that uh, student success uh, uh, per performance statistics for community colleges are not at all where they need to be. And if we're going to uh, enable people to use skills and education to advantage themselves uh, economically and socially, we need to do something to fix our community colleges. And, and the, the good news there uh, is that uh, the community college uh, leadership has got that message. They know uh, that there needs to be a whole lot more focus on uh, student success on, on getting people to and through uh, programs that lead to good jobs and careers. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I, there is a lot of work to be done there and I encourage you to join with me in working with your community colleges, I know many of you do, uh, to really push for higher levels of performance uh, as, a, as a, a basis for building equity. Um, the source of optimism actually, it comes a little bit from Lada's talk. Uh, and uh, you heard about Prudential and about a company who's really uh, taking um, a social values and embedding them into the business. And what we are learning, what, our, what the research tells us, and not research from just people like me, but people in business schools, is that companies who take uh, this sort of social values approach uh, to their business uh, actually outperform companies that don't. Um, so the companies that actually care about investing in their people, who actually care about the environmental impact that they have, who care about the communities that they, um, that they work in and are based in, uh, those companies tend to do better. Uh, you can just look at stock market performance. Um, now, they do better over time, which is the hardest thing, because we know stock markets tend to work uh, minute by minute, week by week, quarter by quarter, mm -hmm. and for a business leader to be able to take a long view uh, and be able to show that this sort of values-based uh, business decision making um, uh, has the kinds of rewards that uh, we, we can demonstrate it does have over time uh, is a hard thing to do. But I think as that message gets out and as leaders like Prudential and Aetna and, uh, and, and others uh, really step up uh, to model the kind of behavior uh, that is a social values-based uh, business decision-making culture, I think we have an opportunity to engage business uh, not just as a place that we maybe can get a couple people some jobs, but as a place that will actually invest in communities, invest in people, and invest in opportunity. Uh, and I see in the business leaders that I work over and over again 
um, people who want to find those opportunities. They may be uh, challenged to find the right institutions to work with. They may be challenged by some of the short-termism that dominates decision-making in their companies. And they may be challenged by not exactly knowing what are the business strategies that are going to get them there, but they are looking for answers. Uh, and I feel like uh, the conversation that we've had th this afternoon and in this conference is full of those answers. Thank you. And that is so um, exciting to get this one-two punch of equity is good for regional economies and equity is good for business. Um, because that's part of the narrative, uh, I think, that we, we need to carry forward. So um, staying on the theme of education, I want to turn to Adrian. Um, and then I'm going to turn to you all and ask you for your comments. So you might be thinking about what are your questions, but first turn your full attention to Adrian. <laughs> um, he, uh, I know that ASU is really revolutionizing how education is delivered and has a real commitment to making sure that underserved populations have access to education. And I'm wondering how you are thinking about this issue of racial equity and how you especially make uh, education uh, available um, for under all underserved populations and what that looks like. So, th so thank you. I, I, I was struck by the, the call for new models. And I think that the, the, the source of pessimism is, well, if we can only innovate around the edges of the existing models, this is going to take too long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you know, I'm, I'm proud to be part of Arizona State University for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons that I'm most proud is because what's in our charter that President Crow instituted early in, in the 2000s when he first uh, started. He said, look, we know why Harvard's a great school. It's because it, you don't go, not you. No, 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 no. Oh, you can go. You can go. We handpick and select along that sort of idea, it, reinforcing this hierarchy of human value. The Civ model for school instead of the staircase model for school. And so President Crow says, we're not going to have a school like that. Those schools are fine. We're not knocking those schools. Good on them. That's where our overlords come from. That's fine. <laughs> But we need universities for the 21st century, and there's a whole lot of people who've got to be educated. And we've got to judge ourselves not by who we exclude, but by who we successfully include. The more people we can include and make successful, that's who we are. And so that's baked into our charter. That's our core mission. Now, we've, had, we've borne fruit in that mission. Uh, when President Crow began, fewer than 10,000 students were minority students. In, in, uh, at Arizona State University. Now, more than 25,000 students are. Fewer than a quarter, in percentage terms, were minority students. Now, 38%. We're not done. And we're constantly trying to understand what the next projection of the institution can be. Now, I want to give you an idea about how new some of these models can be. The model that, that Howard Schultz and President Crow came up with might have been here. Hey, why don't we take barista, and instead of making that a job that sits in that hierarchy of human values, we'll make that a gateway to college. We'll make it so that if you become an employee of Starbucks, you get a chance to go to college. Not a, to go to college in order to serve the Starbucks corporation, in order to align with. No, you just go to college for whatever you want. This is one of the things, and, we'll, and Starbucks will pay. Now, that doesn't solve income inequality in America. But it shows it can be solved, mm -hmm. right? It shows it can be solved with new models, new partnerships, new mechanisms. So uh, that's, I think, where the, the source of hope comes, right? We're not without resources here. We're not without tools here. We're not without well-intentioned people here. I, I, I'm, 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 it's easy for me to be confident. It's hard for you to be confident. You give me the confidence to be confident. So let's, let's hear from these guys. <laughs> <laughs> could, I, could I just say one thing? How many of you have read the book Ebony and Ivy? Anybody? If you haven't, please read it. People of color built the Ivy League institution, brick by brick. Yeah. Mm. That's part of that narrative right. that needs to be part of our American story. Mm. And those okay. stories are just beginning to be told in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. but how much more pride does a young child of color have if they know that their ancestors cre helped to create these august institutions? 
And then they don't feel like they don't belong. They do belong. So I just wanted to. <laughs> Thank you for that. Doug, do you want to jump in here? Please do. Oh, what the heck? Um, I also think that, uh, you know, I'm going to throw out something that is a mantra of mine that I always talk about, and this is, I, I think, could be useful when we're thinking about changing the narrative, and that is um, you either frame an issue or be framed. Mm -hmm. ah. So it's important for us to think about that uh, when we think about narrative change mm -hmm. uh, from the very beginning in terms of how we think about it strategically. Uh, it's our choice. Right. We can sit back and let other people frame us all we want to or frame these issues all we want to. Or we can actually take some agency and do it ourselves. Thank you. So I want to turn to Trabian, who's we've had so much conversation about narrative, and I'd love to hear comments from you in response to what you've heard here, yeah. and then turn to the audience. Yeah, just quickly. Um, so totally agree with you. In fact, we, we do frame uh, the story the way that we want people to think about it and, and the moment and the opportunity that we're in. And we, you know, be me again, think, we, think, we think in terms of movement, right? So we're not a program, actually. We're a network. Um, and it's a network of influencers, there's 100, different national level influencers like Ben Jealous and others. Um, it's a network of doers. There's 143 men that we funded who we keep connected in the network who are working on the issues that everyone cares about. They serve about 500,000 people between themselves, mm -hmm. right? It's a network of media that we actually have stationed in and we present the story about the country and the solutions and what people are doing to build their communities in real time in the media that you actually consume, whether it's NBC or HuffPo or other places. And it's a network of 35,000 individuals who have made a personal commitment. Mm -hmm. Because if it's not personal, it's not gonna happen, mm -hmm. right? And when I gave you that, you know, our, our value statement, all 35,000 people have signed on to this credo because all of us believe that you have to value all members of the human family. You have to reject narratives that denigrate. You have to recognize people as assets. And you have to work together. We all sign on to that. And in believing that, we have a story about our country and our future that we believe in and we want others to join in and believe in with us, and then we go out and do the work. Okay. And are the signatories to this, are they black men who are doing this work or are they allies like others in this room? It, it's not even a question of allies, it's everyone. Because here's the thing, here's the thing. Um, we have been told a lie so consistently, so, so often, that we actually repeat it as if it's the truth, yeah. right? And there's something uh, offensive, you know, deeply personally offensive to the idea of you being programmed to lie on yourself, your experience, your friends, your family, and the nation that you uh, were born, raised, and will die in, right? And so we, um, we acknowledge that lie, and we don't even really talk about changing the narrative. We talk about telling the truth, mm -hmm. recognizing that we all care about educated children, mm -hmm. safe streets, a strong economy, and a vibrant community. Yeah. If there's anybody in this room who doesn't care about that <laughs> stuff, why the hell are you here? <laughs> um, and the truth of the matter is, we've been kept separated by a different narrative. Yep. And we're just asking people to drop that mm -hmm. and work with your friends on the country that we all want to have. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Thank you. OK. So I would love to know from you all, you've heard an amazing set of stories here and <coughs> facts and truths. Um, and I would love to get your comments and your questions for our panelists. Uh, let's see. OK, we've got one over here. Hi, we've talked a lot about changing the narrative. And tell us your name. Oh, hi, I'm Abby Hollingsworth with Bank of America. Um, we've talked a lot about changing the narrative, both around opportunity youth, about race, and but my question is, how do we change that on a macro perspective? We can all talk to our friends, but likely our friends are already bought in. So how do we get the media involved? How do we get the political scene involved to change the narrative at a macro level around these issues? Well, I, I, I can tell you uh, some of the things that we do. So I mentioned that we have um, champions in, in, in different stations. So when it comes to people's, um, how, how we frame our narrative, uh, there's really five or six structural influencers. One is your, your faith tradition, your belief tradition. Another is media, friends, school, et cetera, right? And so on the media uh, level of this, we literally have uh, content partnerships with folks like NBC and HuffPo and others. And so we talk about the same issues that everyone else talks about. I'm on the board of the Solutions Journalism Network. Our whole thing is 
uh, go ahead and tell the story about the crime or the poverty or whatever, but include the story about the solution, about how you solve that problem, and about how people are working together uh, to make it better. So we embed that, we embed the narrative in mm -hmm. the media that people are already consuming, and then we created uh, a book that uh, became a New York Times bestseller, uh, and we work with another, a number of different um, actors and entertainers uh, to reinforce this new story. Can I also add something to that? I think it's important that, and I know this is gonna make people feel very uncomfortable, but I'm gonna say it anyway. <laughs> I think we should reach out to unlikely allies. Exactly. Um, and we you know we just, Ford just became part of the Coalition on Public Safety. And I know people will go, my God, you guys are partnering with the Koch brothers. But yes, we are. Yes. <laughs> and so I think it's important for us to not be afraid of that. And I'm gonna okay. give a quick, quick story you all heard about the Confederate flag in South Carolina. Years ago, I was on a, um, I co-chaired a committee to get it off the top of the, the state house. Mm. And I remember one of the people that I actually reached out to at the time was, of all people, Strom Thurmond. Mm. Strom Thurmond went on the air, and Strom Thurmond said, it's time for us to get the Confederate flag off the state capitol wow. building. Wow. Now, of course, we had other compromise to put it on the grounds, and it, we also built an <laughs> African, most people don't know this, we built an African-American monument also on the ground. But yeah. the point is, it caused cognitive dissonance to those people who are like, oh, well, if Strom Thurmond's okay about taking the flag off the state capitol, but then maybe I need to rethink my thoughts about that. So I think we need to be a lot more strategic and open up ourselves to have these difficult conversations with people who you may think might not be an ally, but who in fact could actually help in terms of changing the narrative. Thank you. So, I have Gail and then Lefa. Well, you, you have it. You well, well, I would just add that those of us in the corporate setting, right? We have a captive audience in the form of our employees, right? Hundreds of thousands of people who we can send out into the world as ambassadors, right? To help tell the story the way it should be told. And so, right, we have owned media, right? Our internal media channels. We, obviously, we have the earned media we're all trying to get to. But we're working very hard, certainly at Prudential, to tell the story, right? We think about Newark and try to change a narrative around how people perceive a place and its people. Mm -hmm. There are deeply entrenched views about that. And so, you know, we're trying more than one employee at a time, but certainly to get folks out on the streets, educate them about what we're doing in the community, helping them meet people in the community so that they can understand there is no other, right? We're all part and parcel of the same thing. Thank you. So thank, th you. thank you for that question. That really is the question. Mm -hmm. And the years of funding that we've been um, doing in this space, and with this being the age of the brain and the age of neuroscience, so to speak, we recognize that the depth of the programming to the belief in hierarchy requires some real science and some real tools mm -hmm. to transform our belief. But I say, if corporate America can have us all wearing jeans, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and anything else, they want us to do. They can be strategic partners and allies mm -hmm. and use the very tools that they use to change our behaviors in the marketplace, mm -hmm. to change our perceptions of one another. How many of you saw Love Has No Labels, the Ad Council campaign? Mm -hmm. Brilliant campaign. Mm -hmm. We worked with them. We're going to continue working with them. Uh, but, but there have been calls after Charleston and the this amazing place we're in as a country right now, for this country to engage in something like a truth and reconciliation experience. Right. Truth, not only contemporary truth, but to really uncover the truth of our history. And yeah. so our board has embraced that call, and we certainly invite anybody in this room to be partners with us in this effort. It has to be designed by all of us, because we can't do what other countries have done, because we're not like other countries. You know, we have to do it our way. Yeah. But it is, in fact, a mass effort that must be undertaken by this country, and it has never been. We have undertaken to deal with the symptoms and the consequences. We have never dealt with the fundamental belief, and that's the work. But we have the information technology today mm -hmm. that we've never had before. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to take another 100 years. We can, as Travion is showing us and many others, we can use today's tools. We can leverage today's brilliance in the millennial generation. And we can actually put an end to this within our lifetime. It doesn't have to go on. Thank you. So um, before I take the next question, I have to say John Gompertz has to get a plane because he has a board meeting tomorrow. And he made this happen to be with us today only on 
uh, this condition that we let him go a few minutes early. So thank you. Thank you so much, Sorry. John. I'm going to take a seat. Uh, so another, OK, back here. Hello, my name is TJ Dubinsky, Capital Workforce Partners. First of all, I want to thank, it's my first time here. I want to thank everyone for having me here because this has been an amazing experience. Um, and one, my comment is, is that when you talked about strategy specifically, one of the things that I think we need to focus on is marketing because it, it kind of gets back to um, the comment that was made to you in the other end of the room. It's where people suffer from self-selection bias where we continu continually feed ourselves the same media over and over again. We have social media, whatever, I mean, we're divided society, and that's, that's what we have become accustomed to do. So from a strategy perspective, I think that would be something to consider as far as like thinking about a marketing plan, because obviously the new narrative that is shaping up sounds fabulous. And from a modeling perspective, I would think with creating a new narrative, the outcomes would also be very beneficial, because there's so many different communities here, because um, we want to have this collective impact, so that we're all on the same page, so we say in 10 years, we're going to do this. And then we can say we did it or we didn't, and then reconvene. Th these are just comments. Like I said, I just I appreciate the opportunity to speak, and I just want to thank everyone here because this has been just an amazing place to be. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so before we go to Dennis over here, any comments about the uh, the marketing kind of approach? Absolutely key. Sounds like agreed. I, agreed. I, yeah. I, I guess I would say one thing, which is. Um, uh, and I, uh, we've, we've done this at, when I was at the Ford Foundation, we actually funded some market research to sort of understand how to, how to talk about some of these issues. Um, sometimes the, 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 the information you get back isn't necessarily information you like. Um, so there are maybe words that you love to use. You just <laughs> love them. They're great words. And yet when you focus group them and you actually try to see, you know, for key constituencies that you're trying to reach out to, those words just don't work. Um, and so I think part of the challenge is not only uh, to have the message, but also be able to frame that message, mm -hmm. even if that means using different words or phrases or examples or strategies uh, that allow us to get to a broader audience. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I think Dennis over here, you had something, and then back over there. Uh, Dennis Ritchie from the Big Picture Company. Um, one of the things uh, you said uh, from Arizona drives me crazy. The university calls them how many people they did not accept in their college. And that's how they get their prestige. We only took 1%, so oh, that's right. you're right. So this has been fantastic, but we're preaching to the choir. Yeah. So you're helping us you know, be inspired to go out and do the work. But I'd like to follow with Doug's uh, Strom Thurmond thing, if, to hear you brainstorm. If you would start going around, and we would start going around to no, the, uh, the non-choir, yep. who would that be, and how would we do that? Because we got to start speaking to others. So I'd love to hear you talk about that. I love that. Yeah. John. Uh, venture capital and investors. Mm -hmm. I, I would try to move Wall Street and try to move the smart money to think about uh, investing and supporting uh, strategies that, that get uh, corporations and employers more focused on investing in their people and communities. Can I also bring up another, mm -hmm. right to talk? Uh, yes. Can I bring up another thing? This goes back to framing the issue. So um, I had to present in front of the, uh, the Roy and Patricia Disney Family Foundation on Saturday about this pathways work we're doing in California around, making sure people who are incarcerated, informally incarcerated, get a high quality education and get support and reentry when they get out. So one of the family members <coughs> asked me a question and said, well, uh, is it, how difficult has it been for you to make this um, argument to uh, Republicans, for example, I mean, have they reacted to you in a way that they're afraid about being soft on crime or whatever? So my response was, we keep in mind that we have three other pathway states in Michigan, New Jersey, North Carolina, where the governors had to sign off on it, the legislators had to sign off on it. Guess what? North Carolina, Republican legislator, Republican governor. Michigan, Republican legislature, Republican governor. New Jersey, Democratic legislature, a very strong uh, Republican governor, but that's actually because of the way the structure is, and in, in, I'm only with his personality, but, but also <laughs> with the structure of it. But the fact is, we framed it not as a criminal justice issue, even though it is a criminal justice issue, but we framed it as an issue of renewing communities. Yeah. Where we're giving people the opportunity to take full yep. responsibility for themselves and their families and their communities. Now, I wouldn't frame it that way for Democrats. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't frame it that way for independents. 
But I think it really goes back to what um, Trebian has been saying from the very beginning, and that is we have to be very strategic about how we frame these issues around the cultural narrative and the audience that we're speaking to. That is, okay, so I have, we have some others on, yeah. Well, my, mine is just that, uh, interestingly enough, the, the difficult audience in our messaging is foundations and uh, nonprofits, right? Um, foundations and nonprofits, particularly foundations, foundations set all the negative labels mm. in their grant requirements, <laughs> right? And then the nonprofit space only gets paid if they can tell the story of death and destruction and how they intercede yeah. to prevent it, mm -hmm. right? And that's how you get your life's blood, right? And in exchange for that blood money, we stigmatize the very people we claim to help. So the, the folk who I've seen struggle the most with this narrative shift is actually us. Because when I talk to, because <laughs> when I talk to corporate or, or um, investors or bankers, they understand that you need the majority of your people actively committed in the economy in order for them to do well. It's not a, yeah. it's not a tough sell. Um, so that's just my but opinion. Could I just add that, and this will be our last comment, so I'll go right you ahead. You do have to make a strong business case. That's one thing. But you can. And, and you can, it's there. We, pu we published a, a, a paper saying that, you know, and, and it is getting response from both sides of the aisle because it is a business case. Mm -hmm. We're talking trillions of dollars. Mm -hmm. But you do have to reach out to the Rotary Clubs of America. You have to reach out to the Evangelicals. You have to reach out to America writ large. And you have to make it our human story, Asian American, Pacific Islanders, Native Americans, Latino. This is really our collective work. But, uh, and I know Travion sort of disses the boomers, but, but <laughs> speaking, <laughs> speaking, speaking as one, uh, <laughs> I would say, and, as, and I also spoke with a 95-year-old who's, who's alive and well and really strong, who wants to give his last whatever to this work, right? That this generational, intergenerational approach to this is very, very necessary if we're gonna succeed. Thank you. So I feel like I've gotten so many tools for changing the narrative here in very, very real ways. I wanna thank our panelists and thank all of you for participating in this. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Monique. Thank you. So we are right at three o'clock and I am going to transition us into our evening. Um, first and foremost, I just wanna note that we are now breaking out into our team planning groups. Those assignments and locations you should find in your convening materials. Um, those will take place for about the next hour, 15 minutes or so. And then right at 445, our affinity group meetings are going to kick off. That not only includes our rural cohort meeting, but we are also bringing together our Opportunity Youth Leaders and also the Opportunities Youth United group as well. And that's also right at 445 when the open space session is going to begin. I said this at the top of the day. We have a P3 discussion that's going to take place, and we also have a discussion that will include our backbone leaders and site leads coming together. I wanted to just by a quick show of hands see if there are any other topics that people want to invite others to be in conversation with them on. Feel free to raise your hand because now is the moment. Okay then, so, oh, we do have one? Thank you, Dana. So will you be here at 445 for that conversation? Okay, okay. So it sounds like we have a data one, we have a P3 one, um, and we also have the backbone site leader one as well. And then also at 6 p.m. we have the California Opportunity Youth Network meeting. And if you have not yet signed up, I wanna encourage you to sign up for Dine Arounds. They'll begin at 7.30. And then the last friendly reminder is that we start back here tomorrow in McNulty at 8.30. We hope that you guys enjoy your evening tonight. And Aspen, thank you for being so thoughtfully engaged with us throughout the day today.